Hello everyone and welcome to Talented Bitches Radio. I am your host Mel from TalentedBitches.com. Uh, this episode we are playing part two of my wonderful discussion with the great Tom Dreesen. Um, if you didn't get to hear episode one, I really hope that you will go back and listen to it. But just to recap, um, in our first episode, Tom uh, discussed how he's got a background in motivational speaking, how that started, and the ways that he specifically has addressed um, comics with his motivational speeches. So he shared lots and lots of insights um, that way with us. Then we also covered his background growing up in Chicago, how he got started in comedy, working with Tim Reed, um, who some of you may know as Venus Flytrap from WKRP in Cincinnati, but Tom, of course, started with him before he was the infamous Venus Flytrap. So um, we also heard about his struggles getting from the beginning to the first uh, time he was able to get on to The Tonight Show. And then we left off with him beginning to discuss his time working with Frank Sinatra and um, the one-man show that he's created based on Tom's comedy and work, but also his time working with Sinatra and memories of Frank. So um, that's where we are joining this discussion. That's what he's talking about when we first tune in. And I really hope that you enjoy part two as much as part one. I know I had a great time with this interview and I've, I've taken a lot from it. So I hope you will too. Please enjoy and live in love everybody. Now I'm doing a one man show around the country called an evening of laughter and memories of Sinatra. So it's, it, it's, it, I'm doing it in theaters of, uh, you know, 800 seats, a thousand seats, 500 seats. Um, the theater goes dark, you know, and the, a screen comes out and then a screen and narrates my life about four minutes of my life. And then he introduces me on the screen, and I walk out, do about 30 minutes of stand-up comedy, and I segue over to a bar on the stage. And I tell a joke at the bar, and the lights go out. And then Sinatra comes on the screen singing, It's quarter to three. There's no one in the place except you and me. And, you know, so I let that mood set in. When he gets to the chorus, I make it one for my baby and one more for the road. The light hits me, and now I'm at the bar, and the audience is like in a bar with me. And I tell him the first time I heard that voice, I was shining shoes in a bar on the south side of Chicago. I was eight years old. And then I take the audience from that eight-year-old boy hearing Sinatra on the jukebox when he was eight years old on the south side of Chicago to one day carrying his coffin out of the church in Beverly Hills. Wow. I take them on a journey telling them funny stories, but poignant stories, and making the audience in the end in tears when I take them to the funeral. Then, of course, I have them laughing. You know, I do a monologue. And I toast them all and say, I wish for all of you what Frank Sinatra wished for you, the very last song he ever sang, that the best is yet to come. And Frank is singing the best is yet to come as they're leaving the theater. Now, my point of that is saying that that's the next progression. Standard comedians working in the comedy clubs all your, all your life, you're not going to make much money and you're going to be stuck in that rut. Every stand-up comedian has a story to tell, how they got there. Now, you can do your act. You can take your act to a the theater and call it whatever you want. You know, you know, I call it an evening of laughter and stories of Sinatra. What do I do in my career? I go do stand-up comedy. When I go on Letterman's show and shows like that, I tell stories. So I just put that into a one-man show. And, uh, and, and again, that's another way to make a lot of money. And also, they stretch out. You know, in Vegas, I do 90 minutes. In theater, sometimes I do two hours, one hour with an hour intermission, you know. It's just stretching out. It's me testing yourself. Many years ago, I saw, I, I, I saw two comedians do it. I've always thought a good comedian can make you laugh for an hour and a half, but a great comedian can make you laugh and cry in that hour and a half because comedy and tragedy are so on the same line. And one falls to the left, one falls to the right. So I've, all, I've, I've only seen two comedians do that, Red Skelton and Richard Pryor. They can make an audience laugh and cry. And I said, one day I want to do that. I want to challenge myself. And that's what this show does every night. I have them laughing and then I have them in tears, and I turn right around, and I get them laughing again. It's a challenge, but it's exciting. Yeah, um, thank you so much for bringing up that show, because I, that was definitely, again, I wanted, I wanted the description of it. And it, it's, it is going to be touring again, right? You're not, you're not done with oh, it? Oh, I'm doing it. Yeah, I'm doing, you can go to my website, tomdreesen.com, 
you know, D-R-E-E-S-E-N, D-R-E-E-S-E-N, TomDreesen.com. And, uh, and my, my schedule is always on there of where I'm going, you know. And, yeah, I'll be doing it. I'm doing it again in Chicago in, in October, and, and I'll be doing it in November. I'm, I, you know, I just do it around the country, and um, there's some theaters that are really interested in it. In Vegas, people are talking to me about going there, but they want me to go and stay, you know, go to a room and then stay there for a year or two. I'm not sure I want to do that, but because I've got so many other things I'm doing with the movies and stuff like that and acting. And, you know. So would you um, would you be willing to give the talented bitches listeners a few um, a few of your stories about Frank or one or two oh, of sure. your favorite? I, I, well, I, I, I've got so many stories. About, you know, how I met him was, was that I read, you know, people say, how did you start touring with Frank? I toured with Sammy Davis for years, and then I was on the road with different artists, and I was touring with Smokey Robinson, and we were working all the casinos, and we were in Caesars in Lake Tahoe. And uh, one night, Frank was appearing next door at Harrah's in Lake Tahoe, and I had worked at Harrah's many times. And so after my show one night, I bolted off the stage, and I didn't even change out of my stage clothes, and I ran a, a block away where Frank was. I wanted to catch Frank's opening. I, Frank Sinatra created more excitement walking to the microphone than most people did with their whole act. It was just exciting to watch him come out on stage. So I was rushing into the showroom at Harris when the vice president of Harris Hotel, a man named Holmes Hendrickson, very powerful guy in those days, saw me. Uh, going into the theater, and he was talking to a big heavyset guy with a c- cigar in his mouth. And he said, Tommy, come here. And I reluctantly went over there because I didn't want to miss Frank's opening. And he said, Tommy, this is Mickey Rudin, R-U-D-I-N, you know, and I recognized the name. He was Frank Sinatra's lawyer, very powerful guy. He said, uh, Tommy, this is Mickey Rudin. Mickey, this is, this is Tom Dreesen. I think Tom would make a great opening act for Frank. And the lawyer got a pained expression on his face like he'd heard it a million times. Mm. And he winked at the vice president of the hotel, and I caught it. I caught the wink, and he looked at me, and he said, Hey, kid, if I gave you a week with Frank, would you want more than uh, 50000 I said, Mr. Rudin, put it this way. If you gave me a week with Frank, would you want more than 50000 oh. He said, Oh, I like this kid. And uh, it, he laughed. And a week later, I got a call. Would I like to work with Frank at the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City? And I figured, yeah, I figured I'll go there for one week and I'll try to get my picture taken. I'll hang it in every bar back in Chicago. And uh, But I went there, and the second night I worked with him, he and his wife took me out to dinner. And I can remember like it was yesterday. He put his knife and his fork down in the middle of the meal. Middle of the meal, and he said, you know, I like your material and I like your style. I'd like you to do a few other dates with me if you're interested. And I didn't say, let me check my calendar. I said, oh, yeah. And uh, then it turned into 14 years, 45, 50 cities a year. Uh, we became friends, you know, I, I stayed at his home six times a year, um, and we became good friends, and I was a pallbearer at his funeral, and I spoke at his funeral. And, and, you know, and why it was important to me, and I was just talking about this tonight to a good friend of mine who writes for Jay Leno, a guy named John Romeo, and I are real good buddies, and we were sitting around talking about how careers go up and down and where they go. But I said, you know, when I was growing up, if you played a word association game with me, if you said tall, I would say short. If you said black, I would say white. If you said show business, I would have said Frank Sinatra. You know, Sammy Davis, Dean Martin. To me, that was show business. Live performing fascinated me. You know, and, and, and I never cared if NBC, CBS, ABC liked me. It really didn't mean a whole lot. But if Sammy Davis Jr. thought enough of me, or Frank Sinatra thought enough of me to grace the same stage with him, and Dean Martin said, come on my shows, and I did the Dean Martin shows. If those guys thought I was good enough to be on the same stage with them, I didn't care what anybody else thought. You could close the lid on me. You know, yeah. uh, I'm a live performer. I love live performing. I love stand-up comedy, and I, and I love being with those guys on that same stage, on the same marquee. You know, Frank Sinatra and Tom Bishop, that meant the world to me, especially back in Chicago when my name was on the marquee of the Chicago Theater with, with uh, Frank Sinatra, you know. Um, but to each his own. Everybody has their own interpretation of what is making it or made it in show business. Uh, like I say, you can close the lid on me, and I'll always be happy with what I did in show business. And I feel like, like Frank, the best is yet to come. I still got a lot of things I'm doing and want to complete before I head for that comedy club in the sky, you know. Well, it's, um, uh, I actually grew up listening to punk rock, which can't be any further from the Rat Pack, but 
I did have some friends that were into them, and I became a very big Rat Pack fan. I've listened to them for years, and I always thought, you know, these guys really have something. If they can get someone like me listening to Dead Kennedys and Bad Religion, and you know, you can imagine um, sitting there totally getting into Frank Sinatra's music. And um, but the one thing when I was listening to them is my my imagination would just go wild about, like, what what was it like to know these guys? I mean, Sammy, Dean, Frank, they have the, their public personas are so warm, so fun. I mean, they just seem like they could be just the funnest best friends ever, you know? Um, and they were. And, you know, and they, they you know, they were, see, the, the, I always tell young comedians what was told to me on my first tonight show, I was getting ready to go out, and I was pacing, and Ed McMahon said, have fun, Tommy, and they'll have fun. And I never forgot that. I tell you, going out and say, have fun. Have some fun. No matter what's going on inside, everybody knows. I mean, not everybody. You, only you know. The audience doesn't know, you know, how you're feeling inside. So have fun. If you're having fun with your material, they're going to have fun. Enjoy it. Enjoy the moment. And those guys had fun. You know, when they went, they, when they you know, they... they they toured together and they did shows together. They did movies together. You know, uh, they, 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 it was, uh, the show was the most important thing. You want to party? They'd party with you all night long. Frank would drink you, you and nine like you under the table. He just, he stayed up till dawn every night. He never went to bed till the sun came up ever. When we were on the road or off the road, when the sun came up, Frank went to bed and he wanted you to hang with him. You know, but showtime, when it came showtime, know your job because he knew his and everybody else better know theirs. Sammy was a consummate professional, and so was Frank. And even Dean, you know, the show was important. You know, go out and, 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 and uh, give the audience the best you got. When I toured with Frank Sinatra, we wore a tuxedo every night, except for closing night, we'd wear a suit. But a tuxedo every night, because he told me, he said, Tommy, you know, uh, every night is a command performance. If we performed before the king and the queen, we would wear a tuxedo, and, because they were royalty. Well, that hardworking guy that works in a factory, that woman, that waitress, that they worked all, all year for tips to come to this show. You know, they're royalty, too. They put their hard-earned dollars down to see the show. We have to treat them like royalty, too. So we never sloughed the show. He, you know, you had to, had to be prepared. And the reason he kept me is because we would appear in the city, same cities each year, you know, and, and, he, and, and the same audiences would come. So I had to keep coming up with new material, and he knew I could do that. And... How how did you do that? What is what is your writing process like? What is your well, like every I mean, I think funny thoughts like every, most comedians. But for, if you sat me down and, and with a line pad and said, "Start writing funny jokes," it doesn't come easy for me like that. Things happen where I'm at, and I say, "Ooh, that could be funny." And so I always have a, a pen and paper on me all the time on airplanes, you know, wherever I'm at, you know, uh, even on the golf course. Uh, something will come to me. I stop and I write it down. Now, when I get enough of these little notes, then I sit down with a line pad and I draw, I, I write the joke, you know, longhand, the way I saw it, and then I start working it, you know. And then when I get enough of those, I'll take my tape recorder over to the lab factory and I start working on new material. Or I might, in one of my major gigs, throw it in the middle, you know, open with strong stuff and in the middle, try out that new material, because then I can go to the, at the end of the show, I know I'm going to take them home properly, you know. But but for me to sit down, if I had to, if I sat down with a lying pad, I could write jokes, but I write it much better the way, and my, is let them come to me naturally, you know, wherever I'm at. But always keep a pen and paper always by you. Or today, my cell phone, I can record it, you know. Yeah. Um, before we get too far, too far away from your um, frank days, uh, well, there goes the question. It was there, and now it's leaving. <laughs> Well, if it, if it, was it about Frank or was it? You know, oh, I know. You, you were, Here, here's what: when I was researching you um, to make my my questions, the one thing that I and this is more of an observation. I'd be curious to hear your comments about it. I really think um, I think it's a pretty well known fact that the Rat Pack is actually a big reason of why the segregation policies of the hotels and casinos in Vegas were mm -hmm. gotten rid of. Um, and so I really, I loved making the connection of how you had started with Tim and you guys were, you know, doing things that were healing, uh, race relations so much. And then, you know, fast forward, you get 
all the way up to Sammy Davis and Frank Sinatra, and I just thought it was so neat how those guys had had been doing that too. You know what I mean? Like, they... sure. And Sammy, you got to remember, was even tougher in those days. But you know, Sammy was the Jackie Robinson of show business. For those who your younger audience who don't know, you know, the first black to play in the major leagues was Jackie Robinson, and he broke barriers down, and he took a lot of abuse for it. Sammy was that way in show business. He 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 broke down the barriers, and Frank, of course. Being Frank's friend didn't hurt because Frank was the most powerful guy in show business, and uh, and he embraced him. And Frank embraced Sammy for a reason, not because of the color of skin, because of the enormity of his talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, that he was black was was irrelevant to Frank. He was enormously talented, and Frank knew that that type of talent had to be exposed to the world. You know, um, uh, you know. So so and they, and and that's what, what drew them together. You know, was their talent first, and then of course their friendship came from that you know um and that's true of tim as well i mean yeah both of them just powerhouses they're not just the oh we we need to fill our racial quota like they, like they they're wonderful great strong performers and uh, then and, and by the way when they were together i mean i would watch them and i worked with them many times i worked with both of them and and with dean i mean they all had their own style but they were good they were really 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 they were extraordinary at what they did you know, today, young, and you, you said you were uh, uh, in the punk bands and stuff, but, you know, young acts today get a lot of excitement from the audience with tech, modern technology, with laser lights and sound equipment. You know, Frank Sinatra Jr. was, a, I mean, Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. were laser lights. They walk out in one. Frank would walk out in front of 20,000 people and start to sing, and in a moment, the guy in the furthest seat way up on top felt like he was in a bar with Frank, and Frank was singing to him. Mm -hmm. He had a way of bringing it all down. You know, Sammy was the same way, an enormous talent. Uh, that Sammy Davis Jr. could sing as good as anybody out there. Frank said he never heard Sammy hit a clinker. Frank would hit a clinker once in a while. He said he never heard Sammy hit a clinker. Sammy could sing as good as anybody out there. He could dance better than anybody out there. He could tell jokes and do comedy as good as any comedian I've ever met. He could do impressions better than any impressions I knew. He could play piano. He could play the drums. He could play the trumpet. There wasn't nothing he could do on the stage. And uh, he, was, he was just a, a, a ball of talent. And I sat in the wings night after night after night watching him and watching Frank. You know, there was a style about them, an elegance about them. You know, they took command of that stage and that was their stage and they owned it. You know, and, and, uh, and that's... They taught me that, how to do that. This is our house. I tell young comedians all the time, and Mel, I may have told you in that seminar, but it bears repeating that, you know, when you walk out on stage at night, it has to be like this. It's a conversation, not a presentation. Mm -hmm. You know, and I usually write that on a blackboard when I'm talking to young comedians, and I say, if you don't remember anything I said, remember this. It's a conversation, not a presentation. So is it your act? Of course it's your act, but it's your job to make it look like it's not an act. You're holding a conversation as if, as if Mel, you and I are married and, 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 and I'm making dinner for all these guests in your living room, in, in our living room. And I say, Mel, oh my God, dinner's not going to be ready for 20 minutes and people have been sitting out there. Do me a favor, Mel. Go out there and tell them some of those funny stories about your childhood and about your, you know, your, when you went to high school and your mom and your dad. Go, you know those funny stories you tell, honey? Go tell them that. So when you walk out into that living room and you say, you know, dinner's going to be ready in a few minutes, but before dinner, can I tell you what happened at Walmart today? And you start to tell those stories. That's the way you go out to an audience at Caesar's Palace or anywhere you're at. When you walk out, we're not in their house, they're in our house. Do you get the difference what I'm saying there too? Mentally, your perception is they're in our house. We're not in their house. If you're in their house, you're an intruder, and you feel like you're intruding upon them, and it fits your, 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 your uh, mindset, you know. And then what you do, you never take your dog out on stage with you, never, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, my, my point of that is saying is that, that the mindset is not in our house. And so, you know, we take command of the stage. It's only we take command of our own living room. Exactly, and I have to take command of this chihuahua. This is this is what Blossom left me with. I have chihuahuas. You, they're amateurs, Tom. This is why this is happening. They're ah, that's they, okay. They just don't. Have being, a, they feel like they're being neglected because mommy's on, on, on doing the radio show. You know. Yeah, but you know, Blossom, she 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 was, I think, the Frank Sinatra of dog comics. If I can, if you don't mind me going there, <laughs> you know, she just had it all together. Um, but I. 
back to what you were saying, the one thing that I, um, when I first was learning, the thought occurred to me that in a t um, an audience's attention span is a gift. Like each one of them has their own things that they want to be thinking about. So for them to actually pause their brain and, you know, like give us that opening, um, you know, I think that's really an honor. And so I started um, cause it, coming up when you're training with other comedians, there's always the, well, I want to be me and I blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and I, of course, I want to be me and I want to present my act, but there's also that other piece of it where, um, you know, you, you need to honor the attention that people are giving you. And um, I don't know, I mean, I guess that's just when I'm writing and when I'm doing my act, that's kind of where I'm, I'm looking to get is that balance between presenting me and um, like you said, if they were guests in my house, I'd, you know, are you comfortable? Are you having a good time or, you know, that sort of idea. And that's, that's the mindset you take them on, you know, they're not, they're not the enemy. They love you. They came to see you. That you know, they, you know. Again, some some comedians like to attack an audience, and and they like to be the last angry man because a lot of times it's fear. They have a fear, and so if they go out angry and mad, and they say the yep word every other word, it's like I'll show you that you can't push me off this stage, and and if you do, I'm a mean you know sob, and, and, and so that that works for them. And other people just lay back. You know, I've I've everybody has their own style. We all start out emulating other comedians. We all start out doing an impression of another comedian that we saw, and we're trying to be like that person because we know that work because we saw it work with them. And as time goes by, you go on stage your first 6, 10, 20, 40 times, you're, you're emulating another comedian, but as time goes by, you start to let a little bit of you out and then a little bit more of you out and a little bit more until you're comfortable in your own skin as who you are. Picasso said, try to paint like another artist, I dare you. You'll always fall short, but in falling short, you'll find out the artist that you are. And that's what we do as stand-up comedians. For me, I've always thought a person is an artist in any endeavor, when they make their work look one word, effortless. Frank Sinatra made singing look easy. You will be my music, you will be my song. You say, I can do that. No, you can't. He just made it look like you could. Mm. You know, Frank, uh, Jack Benny, when I started out with a comedian named Jack Benny, he made comedy look easy, effortless. You know, he just sauntered out there and he made comedy look easy. I wanted to be that kind of a comedian. I wanted to make it look effortless. I wanted to make it look a conversation, not a presentation. You know, uh, and so that's my opinion. If you're a bartender, a truck driver, or a bricklayer, when you make your work look one word, effortless. And, and uh, ranting and raving and screaming has never been what my opinion was ever. It looked like a job to me. Now, that's okay, because whatever works for you, there is, no, there is no right or wrong. There's only one rule in comedy. Be funny. That's the only rule. Exactly. And get to that, get to that space where it, where it does work for you. But um, there's a few, few things I want to make sure um, that we get to. You okay. have... Entertained the troops a number of times, of course. Um, when was the last time that you that you did that? Well, I do it all the time. I, I I was in Iraq and I was in the service myself. So I remember when I was in the service, if somebody would play the accordion, we would just thrill. If somebody would come just entertain us, so you know, you know, the, the entertaining our troops. I know what that means for them. Now uh, I'm going to go August 29th to the grand opening of the Laugh Factory in Chicago, and I'm going to take four veterans with me, who, uh, three guys and a girl, who were wounded in combat, lost limbs, uh, lost legs or lost an arm, and, and they're now doing stand-up comedy. And we're going to call the show From Combat to Comedy. And, and that's what we're going to open the show with in, in um, the grand opening at the Laugh Factory August 29th in Chicago. And then I'm going to uh, maybe take that show on the road a little bit every now and then do some, maybe do some Army bases, Navy bases, and stuff like that, and maybe even do some concerts somewhere. should be fun. When in your web page says that you're, you're on a break right now, and then you describe oh, what no, not if you No, not if you look at my web page now. We changed it today. Oh, my you did? It tells you where I'm going. Yeah, well, you had said, 
you had said, oh, I'm, I'm going to take it easy. And then there's like this whole slew of all these things that you're doing. I'm like, wow, that's your idea of taking it easy. <laughs> so oh. when you're... Yeah, well, you know, I took up July to do a lot of writing for the movie and stuff like that. And, and catch up on some of my writing because I've been on the road so much and I just needed some time to chill out and play some golf and, and uh, you know, let my, my battery um, recharge, you know. Uh, so, but I'm going back out in August and in September and in October. So, I'll be real busy the rest of the year. So, what, yeah, what, tell me what we can all be looking for. Oh, I'm, I'm doing so many things. I'm going to, um, you know, certainly in August, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I, well, next week I go to, um, Ocean City for a big corporate date, and then I go from there to Toledo to the Seagate um, View uh, Convention Center in Toledo to do a big show there, my stand-up comedy. And then um, I come back to L.A. for nine days uh, to chop some new material here, and then I'm heading for um, Chicago August 17th for two weeks of shows and personal appearances. You know, I get uh, three corporate dates there, plus I've got my own golf tournament at the time, Dresden Invitational, and celebrity invitational, and we're going to have uh, do a show honoring World War II veterans <clears throat> because they're dying at 1,100 a day. So I'm doing a big show for World War II veterans. Uh, people are bringing their grandfathers and their fathers to the show, and we're going to, we're going to pay a tribute to them. And um, then I'm going to do a um, I'm going to sing "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" at Wrigley Field on August 26th, and then I'm, I'm going to um, do my show August 29th with the troops, with the wounded warriors at the Laugh Factory, and then I go in September, you know, oh, September I'm doing David Letterman in, um, uh, in late September, and, and then I've got to do, um, uh, I, I, I'm going to go to a premiere with Clint Eastwood because uh, I, I, he's got a movie coming out called uh, Thrown by a Curve, and um, in, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's called Trouble with a Curve, and where he plays a, an old baseball scout, and I had three lines in the movie, him and I did a scene in the bar. So I'm going to the premiere with him. He's a good buddy of mine. And then I'm uh, going to take that clip on the Letterman show. Then i got to go to Boston the 24th and do a big corporate date. Uh, and then it just goes on and on and on, you know. Well, that's what you want to hear as a working man, right? <laughs> that it's just yeah, going I'm, I'm, on I'm and busy. on and on. Never mistake activity for achievement, but I'm busy, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, well, I know that you have known so many personalities uh that have gone through the business. So if I could just, I'm going to, I'll do the name dropping. You just um, give me, you know, just maybe a quick, like, uh, your impression of him or her, or, you know, okay. just, for example. No one's, no one's ever done this before, but I'll, I'll try to have fun with it. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I mean. It's not supposed to be anything. Okay. Just um, David Letterman, what, what Brilliant. do you Brilliant. Brilliant, um, it, it, brilliant, um, enormously talented, uh, insecure, um, uh, you know, uh, dear friend, loyal, um, uh, in, 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 uh, and like a brother to me. Okay, and then um, Jay Leno. Very funny. One of the great nightclub acts of all time. Um, you know, people see Jay on, on I'm, 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 I laugh, but I'm going too far, but, but, uh, I, I don't know if you wanted one word answers, but, but, uh, very funny guy. Um, workaholic. Uh, like David. Both workaholics. Um, uh, unusual, funny, um, you know, um, and an old friend. I mean, you know, he and Letterman are my friends, even though they're not friends with each other. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, uh, very talented, very, and, 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 and Jay Leno was the comic that when all the other comics were outside at the comedy store at the improv and Jay was going on, we all went inside to watch him. That's how good he was in his day, you know, and still is very funny. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like him a lot. Um, did you, now I know you were on the Tonight Show 61 times, uh, Johnny Carson. I did 50 with Johnny. I did 11 with Jay. Okay. But now that I do Letterman, I do Letterman exclusive. I only do I do Letterman every three or four months. Um, you know, so I've done in the last 12 years. I, I do Letterman three, four times a year. So I, you know, and, and and David let me host when he had the shingles. You know, so that's the other reason I'm loyal to David. Every time I see David, I say, "You don't look so good. You should take some time off." <laughs> but um, 
So well, what was what was Johnny like? What were your impressions? Johnny of? Carson, you know, was shy, Midwestern shy guy. He was no one got to know him real well. He was very shy, but um, but also um, a gentleman. You know, naval officer, former naval officer, a gentleman, intelligent. Um, the thing I admire about Johnny Carson the most, when the show, when Johnny walked out, he was the star of that show. When he did his monologue, he was a star. When he sat down and him and Ed did the bits, he, he was a star. But after that, everybody else, everybody else who came on was the star. Johnny would yield. Now it's your turn to shine. And if you were, if you were, if, if, if one of his guests wasn't doing too well, he would throw him a bone and, and try to make that guest look real good. You know, Johnny uh, was very, very smart about comedy and, um, and was a real gentleman. Yeah. And I am very, very grateful that he gave me that first opportunity. Yeah, he seems, you know, when you, when you watch old Tonight Show episodes, exactly how you described is how he, how he comes off. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, and remember this. I can name you 30, maybe 40 comedians that Johnny Carson launched. You can't name me one Jay Leno launched. And I, you can only name one David Letterman launch, and that was Jay Leno, you know. So that, that that's the difference. You know? Yeah, again, of what you were saying in the in the seventies, how he was kind of the. Um, uh, but again, in defense to my friends, David and Jay, the television is much bigger today, you know, much bigger, and it's harder to launch, you know. Yeah, um, you mentioned Billy Crystal. What would um, tell me a little bit about your experiences with Billy Crystal? Billy is is a, you know a, a very talented guy. Obviously, a movie star now. You know, uh, I don't think Billy enjoyed stand up as much as we do, as much as I did. Anyhow, I love stand up. That's my 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 thing. But Billy, um, even though he could do stand up well, but does anybody host the Oscars better than Billy Crystal? You know, I mean, and 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 any he, any he, he's done very well in movies. You know, he's a talented guy. I haven't seen him in a long time, but I see him once in a while. We said, well, we never palled around together. We were never buddies together. I'm a Chicago and he's a New Yorker. But I have respect for Billy. And I, I assume he has respect for, Billy. for me. I don't know. Well, another guy that you mentioned that I actually, I, I love the show Chico and the Man. Tell me a little bit about Freddie Prince Jr. Freddie Prince Jr., I met, I was working in the New York Playboy Club when I was with the comedy team, Tim and Tom. We were headlining the New York Playboy. Freddie was working in the room below us catching our overflow. The drummer told me, he said, hey, there's a funny kid downstairs. Mind you, this is 1972 or three, I think it was. He said, the funny kid downstairs. I said, kid? He said, yeah, he's 18 years old. Freddie actually lied, he was 17. And I said, he, he can't be too funny. And he said, Tommy, this kid's funny. Now, when a musician tells you a comic's funny, they've been around, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, he, he had, didn't have enough time in grade to be uh, funny, I went downstairs and I watched him and he knocked me out. He had stage presence and he was a good looking young kid and funny and had funny material. You know, he was half Puerto Rican and half Hungarian, so he called himself a Hungarian, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, he, he just was, he was very funny. We became friends and, and I, we hung out together in New York and then he came to Chicago. He was working, opening for a jazz singer, a jazz player named Jonah Jones. And I took him to my I little apartment with a wife and three kids. He came by my apartment. We had dinner there. We, you know, we went to downtown and hung out in downtown Chicago. I tried to get him on radio shows. So I've known, I knew him a long time. He was an insecure kid, very insecure. And I'll tell you a true story that I've rarely told. We were on Rush Street in Chicago. There was a little bar called Jay's Bar where they had a trio playing. Freddie and I had spent the day together out of my neighborhood. He had a day off. We came downtown and we sat in that bar and we were watching the band. And Freddie was unknown. I couldn't even get him on a radio show in Chicago. One radio show let him, let him on, but I couldn't get him any show, this unknown kid. Sitting in the bar, he said to me while I was watching the band, he said, one day I'm going to become a big star, Tommy. And we all talked that way in those days. I said, yeah, sure, Freddie, and I'm watching the band. He said, no, I mean really big, Tommy, really, really big. And then I'm going out fast. And I'm watching the band, and I looked at him, and I said, I'm sorry, what did you say? He said, fast, man. I said, w w he said, like James Dean. I said, what are you talking about, a car accident? And suddenly he said, no, man, just fast. I want to go out fast. And I, went, uh -huh. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I kept watching the band. That night, when I went home, my, my ex-wife and I, you know, but, you know, um, 
I'm laying in bed with my wife, and I and I said, Freddie said the strangest thing tonight. And I told her, I said, he said he's going to become a big star and he's going to go out fast. She said, he needs help. I said, what are you talking about? She said, he needs help. I said, what are you talking about? It's a brilliant kid. He's like 18 years old, for God's sake. She said, he needs help, Tommy. And I should have known my wife was a little bit manic depressive herself. So, and I didn't think about it. Now, six months later, this kid is the hottest thing in show business. He's on the cover of Time magazine. He not only did his first Tonight Show and got a sitcom, he's hosting the Tonight Show. He's got his own sitcom, Chico and the Man. And, and, and now he was as hot as he could be. I go out on the West Coast. The comedy team had split up. I'm hitchhiking up and down Sunset Boulevard. And this kid is now this big star with a big tour vet and fly and comes driving up to the comedy store every night and, uh, and was now this major star. But insecure as anybody I ever met. He started doing a lot of cocaine. Then he was doing quaaludes. And uh, one night we were sitting in a bar and he was drinking Cavassier and taking quaaludes, and I said, Freddie, what is wrong with you? You know, you know, one of those chemicals is speeding your heartbeat up, and the other one is slowing your heartbeat down. Your heart's taking a pounding. And he grinned at me, and he winked. He said, you giving me one of your classroom lectures? And, you know, because I had lectured on drugs at the grade school kids. And I grinned, and he said, yeah. I said, yeah. And he said, does that make me one of your students? I said, no, nah, I'm a student of yours, Freddie. But anyhow, we were best of friends. And then... Uh, he committed suicide. It, 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 he got depressed and uh, and one night committed suicide. It was a, it broke my heart, you know. It broke my heart. You know. Yeah. But, uh, but he was an, an enormous talent. And now his son Freddie Prince Jr., who never knew his dad, you know, um, is now you know an actor and a, and, a, and a young star himself. But he never knew his father, you know. Yeah. His. Um I started getting into the Chico and the Man reruns, and then I wanted to know about him. And of course, I, unfortunately, there's been a lot of comics and actors that I'm like, oh my gosh, who's this guy? And then I find out, I fall in love, find out they they died, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, like Mitch Hedberg was that way. I didn't, I had found his comedy, fell in love with it, and then look him up, and he had died months Who was it? Who did you say? Uh, Mitch Hedberg. You know? Oh yeah, sure, Mitch Hedberg. Funny. Oh, what a God. funny guy he was. Yeah. You know. Yeah, amazing. And I just it was like it, it's such a heartbreak because you're just like, Oh my God, I found this new guy and he's so hilarious and oh I'm I'm into it. What's he doing? Oh Mitch died Mitch died of a, did he die from a drug overdose? Yeah. Yeah. Now to me that's suicide in a way. Richard Jenny. Did you ever meet a funnier guy than Richard Jenny? Richard Jenny, most guys, most men and women in comedy, if you did one home box office special, I'd say, wow, that's pretty good. No, a home box office special, that's a lot of material. If you do one, Richard Jenny did six or seven. I mean, he was the, one of the most prolific comics I've ever met in my life. Richard could go do 30 minutes at a, a young at a comedy club, go sit in the car and write a different 30 minutes and come back. He had a way with writing jokes, and he was very funny. I mean, I thought he had the world by the ass, and, and the next thing I know, he commits suicide, you know. Uh, his his girlfriend said that they, they went out and um, had dinner one night, and, and they came home, and, and, they, and they, you know, they had a great evening at home. They made love, she said, and, and the next day they got up, they showered, they were going to go have some breakfast, and they went out to the car, and, and he said, oh, wait, I forgot something. And he went back inside the house and killed himself. What? And, uh, yeah, and, and uh, I mean... But, but I've heard this, uh, you know, th th this isn't the first time I've heard this. I can't tell you how many comedians I've known that either committed suicide or, or, um, or, or overdose of drugs and stuff like that, you know. Uh, and it's, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. You know? uh, not everybody is that way in comedy, but as I pointed out earlier, 85% of all stand-up comedians I've ever met in my life are insecure, neurotic, sometimes psychotic, love-starved wrecks. You know, and the other 15% are gifted, confident people who say, this is what I do. I know how to write a joke, and I know how to tell one, you know. It's the joy of joy, stand-up comedy. And, and some people, I think they thought fame and fortune was going to get rid of all their pain. You know, and if you've got a problem, you need to go get that rectified. You need to go to get into therapy. You know, if you had a pain in your knee and it was throbbing every day of your life, would you allow it to throb? You'd end up going to a doctor. Emotional pain is... is maybe more severe than physical pain you know but there's there is help and you can get help and should get help yeah absolutely and i'm i guess in a way that brings us all the way full circle to um your motivational speeches and 
and why you're out there just spreading such a positive message, which I think on, in addition to all the career things you're doing is, um, it's so great that I, I didn't actually know about you starting initially with him um, doing those those drug talk or anti drug talks. Um, <laughs> and it's so great that you've that you've kept that that going and never you know just was like you know what it was nice nice thing to give um, but you know I I'm doing my career and I don't I really I love that you you never let go of that wanting to inspire people that way and positively. Uh, nothing moves me more than trying to help people be all they can be. We're only here for a blink of an eye, Mel. We're just here for a blink of an eye. And Emerson said, you've lived a good life if you leave the world better than you found it. You know, and and uh, I, I would like to do that. I would like to leave the world better than I found it. If I can help anybody, I'm not, I've had such struggles in my life. It's like God said to me, I'm going to put a load on you the first half of your life, and if you survive, the second half is on me. Because that first half, there was a load on me. <laughs> and, but the second half has been, just been joyful, joy of joys. But I paid a lot of dues. Tim, Tim Reed and Tom Dreesen paid dues that no other act ever had to pay, no other comedy team ever had to pay, because we were an interracial act, you know. And that's what's in our book, and that's what will be in the movie. You know, but, but the ends justify the means. The reward is so much greater in the end. Bertram Russell, and you heard me tell this in, our, in my seminar, I tell young comedians five things Number to be a stand-up comedian. Number one, start where you are. Number two, work as often as you can. Number three, read the book, The Magic of Believing. Number four, realize no one is ever going to help you. Number five, don't ever quit. Number one, start where you are. You live in Toledo, start there. You know, do as much as you work, get up on stage, you know, uh, you know, start out in that town. Start writing material in that town about that town, about your life in that town. And then work as often as you can. Number two, uh, go to charities. Go ask them, can I help you with your church charity here? Can I help you with this? Um, get up on stage anywhere, anytime, any place. Work as often as you can. One, one time I saw a Monday night, he had the greatest line, an open mic guy. He said, I just joined Alcoholics Anonymous, and everybody applauded. He said, I don't have a drinking problem. I needed the stage time. You know. <laughs> so, but, but what a great line. You know. Number three, read the book, The Magic of Believing, by Claude Bristol. If you don't believe in yourself... How can you expect others to believe in you? So read that book. Number four, realize no one is ever going to help you. Everybody thinks that as soon as you can do three jokes, people are going to rush to help you. I've got a sign on my desk. As I'm talking to you right now, I've had it on my desk for years. It says, if it is to be, it's up to me. You've got to create your own, your own market your own product at first. If, if you don't have a marketable product, no one's going to sell it. So you've got to, no one's going to help you. You've got to go out and put together something that's sellable, something that can be marketed, and a unique style of your own. And then when you do that, when you create, there'll be people that can make money off of you then, and then they will try to sell you. you know, and so you have to do it yourself. Keep that sign on, in front of you. If it is to be, it's up to me. Now my fourth, the fifth thing is don't ever quit. This is your dream. This is your blink of an eye on this planet. Don't ever quit it. This is your dream. The, a philosopher once said, most men go to their grave with a song still in their heart. Don't let that happen to you. If that song, if you want to be a stand-up and you really feel you can do this, then don't let anybody tell you you can't. It's your dream. You know, Bertram Russell once said, there are people in show business who become major stars simply because they didn't have sense enough to quit when they should have. You know, that's my story. I slept in a car. My wife left me three times. I hitchhiked up and down Sunset Boulevard. I begged to work for free. I begged. I stayed in line 30 days begging to get five minutes to showcase my talent, you know, because I wouldn't give up. Today, everything that I prayed for, everything that I worked for, everything that I dreamed about, I have. I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm the happiest guy in the world. I want from nothing, you know, and, but, I, but I paid those dues because I wouldn't give up. You know, I, I, I wouldn't let anybody else take my dream from me. This is what I wanted to be, and I am today, everything that I wanted to be. And I'm still working on being more you know, and giving back. Well, Tom, that, I, don't, I don't even know if I can come up with a better ending than that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was, um, you reminded me of uh, Wayne Dyer. I, actually, the first time when I, after I got done listening to you, 
I went home and I was like, this guy's like the Wayne Dyer for comics. It was absolutely amazing. And um, one of the quotes that I think about with Wayne a lot that I heard him say was, I wrote a note to myself that said, Dear Wayne, don't die with your music still in you. And um, it's very much along the same lines of what you're saying. of just like, get it all out. It's, it's just a time is... You know, you think about this, and I think I told you this at the seminar. I was on an airplane one time going from Boston to L.A. It was one of those six-hour flights, and I had read everything but the air sickness bag, and I was bored, and I picked up an old magazine. It was about anthropology, and I'm not interested in anthropology, but it was by a guy named Dr. Carl Sagan, S-A-G-A-N, and he used to be on The Tonight Show a lot. And he was talking about dinosaurs who ruled the planet Earth for 250 million years, and man has only ruled the planet Earth from Cro-Magnon to Neanderthal to now to about 100,000 years or so. And he said, this planet's been here 10 billion years, according to science. And it's going to be here 10 billion more before the sun destroys the earth, that the earth is moving closer to the sun. And in 10 billion years, the sun, this planet earth will look not, not unlike Mars looks now, scorched and burnt. And I put that magazine down and I said, this planet has been here 10 billion years before I was born. And it's going to be here 10 billion after I die. Not thousands, not million, 10 billion. That means my lifetime on this planet is a blink of an eye, a speck of sand, ping, it's gone. That's my lifetime. That you would spend one moment of that blink of an eye doing a job that you don't want to do, that your, that your parents wanted you to do, or your grandfather thought you'd be good at, or that your wife or your husband wants you to do. You know, it's not what you want to do. That you would, do, that you would spend one moment bitching and moaning and cursing your lot in life is an absurdity. It's spinning in your master's face saying, I don't appreciate this great gift of life. Every day is a celebration. You know, what wonderful thing am I going to do? Whose life might I change? Who might change mine? You know, if somebody knocked on your door every day of your life and gave you a gift, a unique, original gift, every day is a celebration. It, it, you, know, you know, there's never been a day like this before, nor will there ever be one again. So every day is a brand new day. And you have that gift. This is your gift today. This, you know, how much would you appreciate that gift? How much would you appreciate the giver of the gift? You know, so that's what life is. Life is a celebration. And when you find the work that you love, oh, my God. My God, that's the wind that, as the Irish say, the wind gets at your back. I'm going to tell you something that I, that I wrote. I toured with Sammy Davis, Jr. It, when I first went with him, he took me to Vegas. I'd never worked Vegas before. Put my name on Caesar's, Mar Mar uh, Caesar's Palace Marquee with his. After that first show that night, I went back in my dressing room, and I wrote this down. It's called The Sound of Laughter. As far back as I can remember, or shortly thereafter, I love to hear the sound of laughter. Whether grown-ups or children, that really didn't matter to me. If I could make people laugh, I was as happy as I could be. You see, when you make people laugh, they get such a lift. My mom once told me, this is a God-given gift. She said, because you'll get so much love, and yet you're still able to give. I knew that I wanted to do this for as long as I live. So I left my home in Harvey, Illinois, to tour around the country and spread some joy. Success was ahead. I just didn't know how far. Soon I was broke and sleeping in the car. But I worked and I prayed and I planned and I dreamed. There were times I was alone, or so it seemed. I begged for jobs everywhere I could, and I bombed a lot of times, but I started getting good. They laughed one night in Boston, I'm proud to say, and soon they were laughing out in L.A. Now, if you're a comedian and you wanted America to know, you had to get a spot in the Johnny Carson show. Well, that happened one night for me. And what a break. Soon my name was on Caesar's Palace Marquee. Well, God's been with me now, and I've gone pretty far. Who knows, when, maybe one day I'll become a star. But if I don't, it won't matter at all. Believe me when I tell you I've had a ball. So now I wish for all of you what happened to me, to find the work that you love, because that's really the key. So when I die and go to the hereafter, I'll miss all of you, my friends. But most of all, I'll miss the sound of your laughter. Aww. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I wrote that years ago. In five minutes, I sat down and it just came to me. You know. Are you kidding? I, really? Yeah, it, it's called the sound of laughter. And some country guy put it into a song later on, but it's my it's my words. You know. Okay, because <clears throat> I I thought I'm like this sounds familiar, but okay. Wow. I, I I I told it to you guys. I think at the um, at the function that I was at. I mean, okay. when I when, when I did the. Uh, the seminar for you, you know. Wow. It just came out. 
And yeah, we, you know, it's, it's one of those, we know when you're inspired and the spirit is in you, you know, and I would, I, I, all those years of struggle, and here I was at Jesus Palace with my name on the marquee with Sammy, and I just became so overwhelmed by that, by that um, moment, that time that my dreams had come to, here I was finally doing all those things that, you know, that I, that I dreamed of doing, you know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. I um, I mean, it's obviously I'm living a different situation than you, but um, ever since I moved to Mexico, every day I kind of have a moment of like, this is real right now. This is amazing. Like, thank you. You know, and I always try to have that moment of no matter how stressed or whatever, I think gratitude is so much a great key of of staying grounded and and um and being able to keep a, a positive attitude that's great because i mean because i mean again it, look again you can here's a friend of mine said to me a while back <clears throat> he was feeling depressed in the spine he was 52 years old and he had a slight heart attack but he was okay he recovered but he told me i'm going through a depression and i'm and i don't know what it is he said all of a sudden i have some fears you know and i said well look if you if you have a, a chemical imbalance i can't help you but uh, if it's just a mental thing, let me put it to you this way here. You know, I, I said that the day that I began to live, that I truly began to live, was the day that I embraced the fact that one day I was going to die. Now everybody said, oh, no, we all know that. I said, yeah, but, you know, I never embraced it. You say I knew it. I knew it, but I, I didn't embrace it. You know, and when I really woke up one day and said, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm going to die one day. So then I, you have a choice. When you really embrace that fact, you have a choice that now you can live every day until you die or you can die every day until you die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if, if, if you want to every day get up and curse and moan and bitch about your lot in life and what am I doing and I hate this and this isn't going good and I don't like him and I don't like her, then you're dying every day. And then one day, of course, you will die. Or you can live every day until you die. You know, it, it, it's, it's your choice. It's up to you. You really can do that. You can change your life. You can change your thinking. You change your life. If you change your thoughts, you change your feelings. Think about this. You're in a car. You're driving somewhere. And you're in a real good mood. And, you know, all of a sudden, you're in a sad mood. You go, wait a minute. Wait, I was just in a good mood. What happened? And you trace your thoughts back. And you go, oh, yeah. I start thinking about that breakup with Bill or, or Louise. Or I thought about that problem I had with my mom. And you realize that one thought changed the chemistry in your body. You were in a good mood a moment ago. But that one thought changed the chemistry in your body. So if a thought can change it to a negative, it can change it to a positive. So teach yourself self-talk. There's a book by Shad Holmesteader called Self-Talk. Find that book and, and read it, you know, and, and teach yourself positive self-talk. Say positive th- thoughts to yourself all the time, you know, every day. Get up in the morning. I get up in the morning, and the first thing I say when I'm opening up the blinds, I say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's just something I say. I say it five, six, ten times. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And at the end of the day, I fall asleep with positive thoughts. What a great day. What a wonderful day. You know, some friends I met and some people I met and places I've gone. And, you know, and I think about some good thing during that day. You know. Well, my friend Mel, <clears throat> I think it's that we I've given you um, a couple of not, I haven't given you one show. You got about seven shows in here. You know. That. I know this is amazing, Tom. Thank you so much. You know, I really, I know. That you can this, chop this up. I <clears throat> maybe I should. I could just milk it for a few weeks. <laughs> Tom? Oh yeah, you could chop it up and you could run it every every three months or something. Yeah, Tom. I'll give you. I'll give you one other thing that I want to give that I wrote that I that I would want every comedian to listen to. Okay, please. All do. the comedians. This is something I wrote one time. It's called the comedian and old Freddie. And this is how it goes. He sat inside his dressing room, feeling ten feet tall. He could still hear the laughter echoing through the hall. Many long years of struggle, nights inside the car, had all been worth this moment for tonight. Tonight he was a star. Suddenly a man walked in, eighty years old of a day. He said, sorry, son, I thought you'd gone. I'll clean up if I may. The young man said, go right, right ahead, sir. I won't be very long. Hey, I'll bet in your time many funny men have come and gone. Am I as good as those before he heard himself exclaim, surprised that he had asked that, but compelled to just the same. 
The old man smiled as if he knew the hardships of the game. He said, yes, son, I've seen them all and the way they handle fame. Now, you've got more than most I've seen, but if you really care to hear, come back out on stage with me and let me have your ear. You see those empty seats out there that house your many fans and that picture of your family and, and children that's on your makeup stand? Well, when the sweet applause has had its day and you are left alone, the truest fans who knew you then will still be there at home. Thank you, old man. And what was your name? You've given me more than my fortune and fame. He said, you're welcome, young man. And my name, my name is Old Freddy. I wish you the best because I know you're ready. Next night, he could hardly wait for his second show to end so he could catch the cleaning man and talk with him again. And as the owner passed his door, he paused to say good night. He asked the comedian why he's sticking around. Is everything all right? He said, I'm waiting for old Freddy. I talked with him last night. He gave me some great advice, the kind I know is right. The owner said, but son, old Freddy ain't been here for years. He came here when this place was built and even died right here. Ah, thank you, old man. And what was your name? You've given me more than my fortune and fame. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wait, and when did, you, when did you write that? I wrote that you know, several years <clears throat> after the, 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 uh, the sound of laughter. But. So I put this in my one-man show sometimes. All comedians have a story. All comedians have wonderful stories to tell. You know, and your act is part of your story. You know, and, and then how you got there, how you wrote that act. How your, your parents told you, go to it or, or don't do it. How friends and family are on your side or how they weren't on your side. How club owners were on your side or how they weren't on their side. How you struggled through all that. The friends you made along the way. The nights you went to, to, to sleep choking and sobbing because you couldn't get that break. And knowing that you belonged in a business that you loved so much but just couldn't get that break. And you bombed that night in front of people that could have possibly changed your course and you go to sleep, you can't sleep all night long, you're choking and gasping. And then other nights you go to bed and, and, and you're a brilliant and on cloud nine you can't sleep because you just killed that audience and they loved you and you loved them and people were patting you on the back as you left the stage that night. You know, that's your story and that story should be told. That's a one-man show. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it, it's, a, it's a tough roller coaster to go to to go through, but yeah, every every comic has those those wonderful stories, and wow, I know you're not even done with all your stories, Tom. We could, I could. You know, I, you know that I could stay in this phone till dawn, but I have to go now. Yeah. <laughs> stay in this show till dawn, but but I do have to go. Well, I do <laughs> hope that um, someday maybe we'll see you down here in Merida, Mexico. I know that you have fans here that would love to see you, so. Well, I'd, I'd love to do it, and you never know. If, if there's a theater down there, maybe one day I'll bring my one-man show there, An Evening of Laughter and Memories of Sinatra. People can go to my website, TomDreeson.com, and I can be contacted through that website. I will definitely be sure that um, that's all written um, under the video as well. And um, Mr. Tom Dreesen, I cannot thank you enough for spending this time with me, and I can't thank you for just as a younger comic, being the comic that you have been in the industry and the inspiration. And this has been such an honor and a thrill to have this conversation with you, sir. I just, I can't thank you enough for basically just being you, Tom. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, for Mel, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you and, and those who are listening. And I'll see you, as we always know, I'll see you.